shows the apple of our eyes. The big apple is back. Circus is back in town. There is something so comforting about going to an old-fashioned circus with simple, amazing acts without all the bells and whistles, although there is a funny bit with horns. They do the usual acts with some unexpected twists and tricks. How Jam Dam is able to balance on all those precarious levels defies gravity. Gamal Garcia Tunizani's juggling has some smooth moves. Between the trapeze and high wire, I have no idea who stretched out my jaw more. The Belendas, I mean the final act, the, the famous Nick Belenda is there. It's like with the seven pyramid on the high wire. Oh my God, it's amazing. Oh, shut up, outside. The Anastasini brothers make you wonder about sibling rivalry as one while on his back tosses the other doing a double somersault to a standing position on the backs of his feet. And Jenny Bidell has the cutest white and black ponies and doggies. And Grandma's back with Mr. Joel. And they're the best kinds of clowns being funny without being scary. So no child cried during their appearances. Once again, Mark Lonergan and Joel Jeske have put together an enticing, um, trancing, and grossing entertainment. Go to the circus. It's so much fun. At primary stages, Kate Hamill's Pride and Prejudice follows the sense of Jane Austen's early 19th century novel while radically updating its sensibility. It concerns Mrs. Bennet, who wants to marry off her four daughters, her husband who withdraws, and you do have the smartest daughter, Lizzie, who's sort of in a bit of a tizzy with, um, <laughs> with the very snobbish... Mr. Darcy, but nonetheless, the two of them are somewhat attracted to each other. Her um, other daughter, uh, Jane, is very attractive, but very shy about letting Bingley, who seems to be very interested in her, know that she's interested in him. And then the youngest daughter, Lydia, seems to be, have a dangerous proclivity to play with soldiers. And then there's poor Mary, that everyone shrieks and scared and ignores her. Oh my God, that was very funny. They double up in characters, and it's, oh my God, they were so clever and funny. Uh, except to me, it seemed more like circus aperies than the comedy of wit that I would expect from uh, Jane Austen. If they called it Pride and Prejudice and Monkey Business, then maybe they could get away with it. But I was really appalled. <laughs> I, to me, it was one of the worst shows I've seen. And I laughed my ass off through the whole thing. I mean, there is a bit with chairs that I mean, I, I said there's a chair gag that would make Mark gag because this is so not his humor, but I know. it's so I'm, my I'm humor. I'm sitting there with a sour face. Well, a lot of people, most of the audience seem to enjoy it a lot more than I did. I, I mean, I enjoyed it so much, I didn't even let his, like, hermogeny presence, <laughs> like, spoil my fun because this is so much fun. And, oh, my gosh, the way they uh, carry on, like, going from... from male to female and costume changing is just a, a, incredible how they do it. And they're, they're very talented, but it's really not Jane Austen. Oh, I, well, I, like I said, if they can have Jane Austen chasing zombies, I don't see why they can't turn it right, into a body to act. But they could call it and monkey business, and, it's, but, and it's truth in advertising. Well, so, you know, if you usually follow Mark's line of <laughs> review. Stay away. But if you are like me and like the late You'll great love Barry, it. you will love this and just have the best time of your life. So unhappy for me. And major happy for me. <laughs> At CSC, Fiasco Theater is presenting Shakespeare's play about twins, Viola and Sebastian, um, shipwrecked and separated in Illyria. This is Twelfth Night, of course. Viola, disguised as the boy Cesario, works for Count Orsino to help him pursue his love, Olivia, who has who spurns him and seems to be unnaturally interested in Cesario. There's also a lot of very funny comic characters. Um, Sir Toby Belch, who's related to um, Olivia and his cohort, uh, Sir 
Andrew Agucheek, and then the maid Mariah, who's part of their company, and the very, very, very stuffy puritanical Malvolio, who's the major manservant, who's their nemesis. And Eva, you should say a lot more. Oh, okay. Um, I love fiasco. They, they can, they always, they're, they're like the Queen's Company. They take, because you know me, I hate Shakespeare. They make Shakespeare accessible and fun and actually understandable. It's almost like they're talking our language. It's not like the fusty old Shakespearean language, but like, I got all the jokes, I got all the puns, I got all the naughty entendre. I mean, it was just like, like a conversational with the audience. The audience was really drawn into this. And my only trouble with this play, it always the same thing. I hate, hate, hate what they do to poor Melvolio. I mean, fine, he's a pompous ass, you want to humiliate him, but to throw him into a dungeon and treat him like he's mad, they always go too far, and I can never like that play because of that one thing. Well, I, I basically liked the play more than Eva, but I felt this production had a lot of problems. The um, It makes sense to have some ropes and suggest seafaring because it is about a shipwreck, but most of it takes place in noble courts. So all the sea shanties that are constantly slowing down the already somewhat turgid action are like totally unnecessary. Um, I found some of the double casting very confusing. It looked like Sebastian was serving in Orsino's court, and that, you know, threw me. Oh, it until didn't I realized me. he was supposed to be a different character. Oh, no, it didn't throw me at all, because he was, he, was, he, he was playing the character so incredibly differently that I didn't even realize it was the same actor. No, really. And also, the action of Sea Shanty, I thought was the most cleverest thing of all that they did, was turning this into, like, a total shipwreck theme, because not only are they shipwrecked for real, literally, but figuratively as well. They're shipwrecked with, the, with their grief. They're shipwrecked with their love. So they're mm. shipwrecked with their pranks. It's just a device. It's not a holistic approach. But to I think it's very clever, is. and I, it makes it much better. And I love this. I mean, you thought it was turgid, and I thought it yeah. was exciting. And I was like, I, I was like, and I've seen a hundred thousand twelfth night. I see this is like my twelfth twelfth night, and I, I was like seeing it for the first time. Well, for so me, it was like again, the worst of the many. I've again, seen. we disagree. Yes. We're back to this being disagreeable again. <laughs> <laughs> at St. Clement's presents the rise and fall of Robert Moses, a visionary with a sense of New York City as a shining future of parks, beaches, and highways and bridges for the convenience of the private automobile. In the 30s, he was very popular with both ordinary folk in New York and bigwigs like FDR, LaGuardia, and Nelson Rockefeller, also a character in this. In the 50s, a number of forces worked against him. He failed to keep the Dodgers and Giants in New York City. Rockefeller resented Moses' grandstanding and felt that he would be stronger on the national scene without him. But most importantly, Greenwich Village activist Jane Jacobs, played by Molly Pope, um, led protests against his plans to destroy her neighborhood by running a highway through it and displacing the residents. She championed organic neighborhoods with mixed uses as opposed to Le Corbusier-style isolated futurist residential projects envisioned by Moses. I would have liked a lot more of um, Jane Jacobs, but Constantine Maroulis and Casey Chiquez Moses and his live-in girlfriend were really wonderful. The music is good, classical kind of hard rock with some good ballads. And the lyrics are pretty interesting. I just thought the book could have used a little more work. I gave it a happy face minus. Ensemble, ensemble for the Romantic Century, which brought us Van Gogh's ear last time around, which I found rather boring. But I liked a lot has brought us the much more interesting Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is written by Eve Wolf, and it's got Robert Fairchild as a creature who also did the choreography. And I must say, it was a very thoughtful choreography because it added to the narrative of his struggles in an unknown world that he didn't ask for and was constantly being rejected just for existing. I think it would have been more moving, though, if he'd had on a hideous mask or his movements weren't so elegant, because it's hard to imagine this gorgeous physique in front of us should cause such a consternation and cruelty. And what elevated this Frankenstein was the subtext of a mother constantly losing her children in birth or at a very young age and wishing she could bring them back to life. 
the real monsters were the heartless men in her life that expected her to get on and deal with the death of a child as if it were nothing. I could have done without the singing tree, even though Christy Swan has a lovely operatic voice, but as I am not fond of opera, this portion of the show bored me. I much preferred her son costume in the second act. The small trio musicians set the gothic melancholy mood better than the singing. Um, Robert Farchild is a marvel to watch. The eminent acting of Mia Vallette, Paul Wesley, and Rocco Sisto made the story more human and relatable. This is one Frankenstein that elicits tears more than fears. Yeah, I agree. The, um, I really like the backstory of Mary Shelley's life. And even though there was a much higher infant mortality and it was pretty common for um, mothers to lose kids as miscarriages, these men were totally unsympathetic, and they're supposed to be the artistic intellectuals, you know, who you think might be a little bit more caring. And sensitive. Yeah. A I, sensitive artist, puh. But I, <laughs> I didn't feel the music really gelled with the play as much as it did in Van Gogh's ear, and also Van Gogh's ear had much more astounding visuals. Here... You know, it wasn't quite as wonderful to look at, but... Oh, Robert still, Fairchild is, a, is an astounding visual, believe me. Well, he's a great performer, but, I mean, it, it didn't do the stuff with brushworks. It didn't do anything more So about, he, had, he had footwork, which is much nicer. Okay. so we disagree about which one we like better. Yes. But, but they still, I think that they do very interesting projects. Um, yes, it's a happy face minus. Okay. Yeah, it's a happy face minus for me as well. So we agree, basically. Well, we agree about certain things, but disagree about details. <laughs> I want to take a time out here to do a plug for Feinstein's 54 Below. I've been going there a lot lately, and they have the most incredible shows there. For instance, I saw Rose Kingsley. She was doing an entire Mercer evening, and she had her special guest, Andrew Porritt. And they, she told us all about Johnny Mercer, stuff I didn't even know about. And she's got this wonderful, perfect singing for Johnny Mercer song because she's bluesy and haunting and, and belty and, and tender. And she's just a fabulous singer, Rose Kingsley. I never heard of her, and I just like, whoa, I love this woman. I saw it went there October 24th. And Andy Porch was hysterical because he took Summer Wind and he did other personalities singing it, like Al Jolson, Sammy Davis, Elvis, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra. He's a very good mimic, but he also has a sort of Frank Sinatra way of singing songs. And they did songs I, ne I never knew of, like This Dream's On Me and all these wonderful songs. And then I went on uh, December 26th to see Broadway Babies bring new life to a very merry, unauthorized children's Scientology pageant. And that is an Alex Timber, and, who did Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and Kyle Jarrow, who's on Broadway now with SpongeBob. And they put, it's hysterical, these little kids in these little white little angel costumes, little halos. They're, they're telling us all about L. Ron Hubbard, who is a crazy, weird science fiction out there guy who caused this religion and how he comes even the IRS into like joining his religion after they're trying to audit him. I mean, he was a smooth operator. And um, this week, which I will be showing on my Facebook page, we're seeing uh, Scott Siegel's doing Sinatra, uh, Broadway's Greatest Hits, Cry Ballads Only. Uh, they, they're getting the original kids from Merrily We Roll Along are doing a couple of concerts here. So just go to 54 Below and just check out their calendars because there's always something amazing going on. I mean, Alice, Alice Ripley and Emily Skinner in a show called Unattached. I mean, you have Norm Lewis. I mean, they get amazing. So 54 Below just gets such a happy face for me. They really are an incredible institution, cabaret. At the Pershing Square Signature Theater, you can see 20th Century Blues, written by Susan Miller, directed by Emily Mann. It concerns photographer Danny, played by Polly Draper, who wants to show the series of photos she has taken over once a year for 40 years of her friends, Gabby, Mac, and Syl. The women originally met in jail, and their lives are very different now. Uh, Syl is a real estate person who's 
having trouble um, finding a decent home situation for herself. Gabby's a veterinarian, very upset when any dog dies and afraid of what she'll have to, her life will be like after her husband, who's perfectly healthy, goes. And Mac is one of the last very serious, very political print journalist and also a black lesbian who's an outsider by any stance. And we should mention they met in jail doing protesting. Yes. I think it was against Nixon or... Yes. or, or they would well, in the 70s, it would be against the war in Vietnam. Right, yeah, so that, that's how they all met to be. So the, these are socially conscious people. Okay. And um, and we should also say that French House Stuart Dorn, who played Mac, the journalist, you know, in the dying world, and then you have Catherine Grody, who reminded me of Ruth Gordon, because she was this, oh. she was this energetic, yes. spitfire, always optimistic, always trying to find a positive spin, always trying to, you know, be supporting and everything. Everything else, I just loved her character. She was adorable. They were all interesting characters. I mean, and, and still, we should say, it was Alan Parker. And um, oh, and the mom uh, was uh, who was the mom? The mom is um, Polly's mother, who's demented oh, but Beth still Dixon. very sweet Beth and Dixon. very loving. Yeah, she was adorable. And then her son makes an appearance at one point, Simon Charles. So right, Carr, but the really. conflict is about the will all the women give permission, you know, sign the waivers so their photos could be included in the show. In this retrospect. Because it's sort of like, it feels like an invasion of their privacy when this was really, you know, something that was never really meant to be shared with the world. Anyway, this was a wonderful play about women of a certain age that I mm -hmm. could totally relate to, and I really appreciate it. I thought it was well written and well acted. I forgot why I gave it a happy face minus, but there must have been something that annoyed me about it. Oh, something always annoys right. you. <laughs> but it's still good. It's this, worth seeing. And it didn't annoy me. Meteor Shower Now on Broadway is written by Steve Martin, directed by Z Z Jerry Zaks. We have a sweet married couple, played by Jeremy Shamus and Amy Schumer, who invite this other couple, who are not sweet, to come visit their house in California on the night of a meteor shower in 1993. And it soon becomes apparent that the other couple, played by Laura Benanti and Keegan-Michael Key, are playing some kind of game that's not all that much fun at the expense of the sweet couple. And the play goes on and becomes more pretentious and more doubling over itself, but there are some very funny jokes and some wonderful performances. Yeah, th this is, a, I guess you call it weird but enjoyable with a lot of WTF thrown in at the end. But because of the, the act, I mean, Laura Benanti, with, she's, you, she's a great comic presence, but here she gets to be deliciously evil and manipulative, which is you know, usually not. Yeah, just, she's usually the sweet girl. Yeah, and, and <laughs> Keegan Michael Key, as and people who know him know, his specialty is anger and meanness and viciousness and being loud and oh god it was so funny and Jeremy Sheamus is perfect at playing the, the sweet mild mannered you know little nerdy guy and Amy Schumer actually I think she's really quite dumb to have stage presence and th when the two of them the were like link, not to me <laughs> and, and it was hysterical when they'd like you know they, when they get into a fight they hold each other hands and say all this like psycho babble stuff at each other to make everything right so basically ignore the plot because the plot makes no sense enjoy the performances enjoy these brilliant comics up there and the funniness of it without making sense of it because you cannot make sense of this yeah, I'm giving it mixed faces. I mean, Steve Martin is a very clever comic writer, but some of his other plays and novels seem much more poignant to me. I'm going to give it a happy face minus, because it was just... You enjoyed it a little more. I'm just saying minus the plot, but the rest <laughs> of it was all great, so... I just want to give you guys a heads up. Broadway Con is back. My 
favorite time of the year. You can have all your holidays. This to me is a theater holiday for from January 26th to the 28th. For that whole weekend, you just live at Jacob Javits Center and you get panels from from theater that you know, the upcoming theater. Like you're gonna get all the people from Frozen. And like last year we got the SpongeBob people, so you get a heads up on what's going on, and you get in the Heights, Lynn Manuel Miranda always comes and brings all the years original people and does a thing and there's uh, behind the stuff stuff with the lighting, the costumes, the sets, all the top notch Broadway people and there's just amazing events going on throughout the whole thing and they get incredible people like Christy Aldemore, there'll be an Anastasia sing-along and, and you'll get Nicholas Barrage and Laura Benanti, uh, Liz Calloway, Carolee Carmella, Lily Cooper, VM Cox, Andrew Keenan Bolger, uh, Chad Kimball, Donna Murphy, Bryce Pinkham, Laura Osnes, I mean the list goes on and on. I'm just saying, you, you drop everything Leave your cares, your woes, your winter blues behind. Go to Broadway Con and find out all the information on www.broadwaycon.com because really it is the best event of the season. And oh, major happy face, happy face, happy face. After Broadway Con, go to the Wings of Freedom Mandoki Soulmate Concert at Beacon Theater January 29th to benefit Music Cares with an amazing alignment of musicians. And this is just a tip of the iceberg of the interview that I had with Leslie Mandoki. I'll be posting more of it later. I'm Leslie Mandoki, and I'm uh, very honored and very privileged to be here in New York City and to talk about, talk about our very first uh, public concert uh, in the United States. Uh, January 29th in the Beacon Theater, what a legendary venue as well. And uh, we played our Wings of Freedom concerts uh, in and famous European uh, iconic venues like the Hammoth Apollo in London and the Olympia in Paris and the Concert House in Berlin, the famous uh, largest rock festival in uh, Europe, the Sigurd Festival, which happens to be opened up 25 years ago. So, and we've been awarded, and uh, later on, uh, and this was a great, great honor and privilege, uh, and a poly the festival in Cannes, uh, southern France, and uh, so I'm, I'm very, very happy that uh, we make our very first touchdown in the United States in a, a fabulous Beacon Theater on January 29th, uh, a day after the Grammys. It's a collaboration with the Grammys, and we are, of course, it's a great moment of life for a, a guy who was born behind the Iron Curtain uh, in Budapest and living in uh, nearby Munich, uh, by Lake Sternberg, and traveling his life uh, away. As a musician, as, as I'm, I'm very, very pleased that we are I'm just in the collaboration with the Grammy organization and, and it's Music Care, we are here and, and we can play this uh, kind of very ambitious, very uh, idealistic kind of music where it's based on the idealism uh, um, of the 70s and, and the craftsmanship of the 70s um, because we all became musicians because we had the feeling that music can change the world to be a better place. Mm -hmm. Oh well, uh, the story is kind of simple. Everybody, all of us, um, in a kind of uh, dark moment of life. My darkest moment of my life, it was as my father was died. Uh, he had cancer and he lost the fight against cancer. So, and I was 16. And the very, very last day of my father, I was sitting next to him and said to me, uh, son, uh, you have to promise to me that my grandchildren are never gonna read signs of papers. So I said, Daddy, there is the Iron Curtain. And he said, it's not for you. Go and uh, live your dreams and don't dream your life. And I was giving me a line, what I wrote a song about, a dream is not a fool. But I learned that um, dreams can only fly on the wings of freedom. So but I also said that this is really, really important that the musicians are taking care of musicians because um, this is a huge privilege to, uh, to have the love of our audience and, and, uh, and allowing us to, to create our art. This is just an incredible, uh, lucky way of life. And I think that we 
I absolutely uh, have to focus on that to to give back to the people who are not that lucky uh, and for some reason they couldn't reach out for the audience or, or, or were, were falling in on the way. It's, it's not an easy life to be a musician. It looks like so we, we just you we misuse the media to tell that we have an easy, funny uh, uh, life and uh, this is always just a celebrity thing. Uh, and this is, it's also hard work and it's also a wonderful and a, and a fragile work. And uh, so herefore, I think it's very important that we do uh, realize that uh, the Grammys uh, music care uh, does, does something very important to, to help to the musicians who were not as lucky as I was. This is Mark Sabbath's review. Blessed Unrest, the Snow Queen, adapted by Matt Apartney, sends Gerda on a quest to the frozen north to find her BFF, Kay. Along the way, we meet a helpful pair of crows and a reindeer. The Snow Queen combines a strong text, compelling characters, exciting movement, lucid direction, and clever small-scale spectacle to provide a great theatrical experience. Even on the coldest day, this will warm your heart. So Mark gives us a major happy face. He liked it. Mark, he liked it. As usual, I've run out of time, so bigger reviews and where to go see these plays are all on the Facebook page. Clyde Barnes Awards are going on January 8th. Planet Connections has 10-year anniversary. Hatsi Tati Hungar on his back, a oh, celebration. And at the Actors Temple, Viva Max, I'm going to go see that. Like I say, all the important information will end up on the Facebook page. Also 54 Below is Matthew Morrison, Drowsy Chaperone, Vonda Schmidt Shepherd. Pangea is also great. It's got Carol Lipnick and Penny Arcade doing her wonderful show. And don't forget New Victory for the Kids. Lyrics and Lyricist is back at the 92nd Street Y with the Bobby Darren story. <coughs> and National Theatre Live Follies at Symphony Space. And Sheen Center is always a fun place to go. Here is back. Irish Rap with Disco Pig. La Mama has some great stuff. And The Brick, they just had their 15-year party. And at the New Ohio Theatre is um, the Blessed Unrest Snow Queen. Under the Radar is at the Public. Go check out the schedule for that one. And these are reviews that are you can find on our Facebook page that closed already. Parody production recommendations. Don't forget to pick up your performing arts inside of the cultural heartbeat of New York City. Our next show is January 20th. And again, go to Twitter and Facebook, especially Facebook. Everything is on the Facebook page. <laughs>